Hey guys, how's it going? It's Garamatic, and today's video we're going to be talking about fentanyl. Now, not only is it an epidemic in Canada, but it is also one of the most deadly, if not the deadliest drug in North America. Now, for today's video, I'm just going to briefly explain what the drug is, what it does, how we as paramedics are able to treat opioid overdoses, and then finally how people like you are able to help reduce the amount of deaths due to opiate overdoses. Now, in Ontario, the number of opioid-related deaths has been steadily increasing over the past few years, with 2021 seeing a record of 2,907 deaths, according to Public Health Ontario. Now, year over year, we're seeing more hospitalizations, more emergency department visits, and more 911 calls centered around overdoses and opioid-related medical concerns. This is a huge problem that we all need to take seriously and talk about. Now, with that all being said, let's hop into it. So in order to understand how and why a drug can so drastically affect someone's psyche and how they can be extremely dangerous, we have to understand a little bit about the chemistry of opioids and how they affect our body. Our nervous system has receptors that opioids bind to when they're consumed. Now, as these receptors are bound to by the drugs, the physical effect starts. And in general, it's a good rule of thumb that the more receptors that are bound to, the more severe the effect. However, as these receptors get used and abused by these drugs and keep getting bound to, in an attempt to kind of balance itself out, the nervous system will start to get rid of some of these receptors. Now, this function plays a huge role in the term that we all know called tolerance. So the question becomes, what is fentanyl and what effect does it have on the body and mind? Well, the answer to that is actually pretty straightforward. Fentanyl itself is a synthetic, meaning lab-created opiate, that is used as a pain medication and as an anesthetic. It is extremely potent. For example, it's about 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine and is lethal at extremely low dosages. To put in perspective, injecting about a grain of rice's worth of fentanyl is capable of killing a fully grown adult. Fentanyl affects the central nervous system, making the patient or user feel physically numb, drowsy, slightly euphoric. And another effect is that it really heavily affects the respiratory system, slowing down the respiratory rate dramatically. This drop in breathing is the primary concern that we as paramedics have when treating overdoses, as it can be so severe that the patient can stop breathing or breathe at a rate that isn't really able to sustain proper oxygen levels to the heart and to the brain. This can cause the patient to die, obviously. Now, the majority of these overdoses are caused by batches of home-cooked fentanyl that are extremely inconsistent in the concentration of fentanyl compared to the filler. Now, I had a question, well, what is the filler? The filler is basically what these drug makers use to kind of pad out their uh, supply so that they can sell more by cooking less. And because of the majority of this drug on the street isn't lab created, nor created in a controlled environment, each batch has extremely concentrated parts and unconcentrated parts, making it super inconsistent. This means that every hit, every point is a gamble with one's own life for the sake of a high. I just want to be clear that personally, I see addiction as a disease and that the choice to continuously use and abuse drugs is forced by biological, uh, biochemical, and physiological processes, and that is near impossible for most addicts to quit their destructive habits without outside intervention. With that being said, outside intervention is only possible if our efforts as healthcare professionals and as society as a whole are wanted by these addicts and these, you know, this hurting group of people. And it's only possible if we help to reduce the stigma around addicts, around addiction, and we actively work towards treating addicts as humans that deserve the kindness and respect that we all deserve. I may talk about this in a later video, but I would like to stay on topic. So, you know, just stay tuned for a different video on that subject. So then when it comes to an individual overdosing on fentanyl, what is the treatment? Well, I want to introduce you to the miracle anti-opiate drug, Naloxone, aka Narcan. Now, this drug is what is called a competitive antagonist to the opiate receptors. And just to put that more simply, uh, fentanyl and Narcan bind to the same receptor sites, but with a few key differences. Fentanyl causes heavy cellular response, causing the effects I mentioned before, such as the drowsiness, sense of euphoria, the numbness. Whereas Narcan binds to the same receptor site without causing that cellular response, meaning 
no high. The other key difference is that Narcan has a much higher affinity than fentanyl, meaning that it is more likely to kick the fentanyl off the receptors and replace it with itself. One way you can think of it is having a piece of iron in between two magnets. One magnet's going to be weaker and the other magnet's going to be stronger. Now in this case, the piece of iron in the middle is going to be our receptor site, the weaker magnet's going to be our fentanyl, and the stronger magnet's going to be our Narcan. Now it just makes sense that the piece of iron will then tend towards the stronger magnet rather than the weaker magnet. And this visualization is kind of just a, a an example just to kind of illustrate the concept of affinity. So some of you might be wondering, well, what does this look like when we put it into action? Well, let's imagine that someone is currently overdosing on fentanyl and their breathing is critically slow. Then someone jabs them with the Narcan and as the drug makes its way through the body, it starts to rapidly kick off those fentanyl molecules and quickly reverses the effect therefore increasing the level of consciousness of the person and increasing their breathing rate. In a matter of minutes, it will seem as though the person is completely sober because very few, if any, of the fentanyl molecules are actually affecting the body. Now, this is the part of the show where miracle, the miracle part of this drug, wears off and the harsh reality starts to kick in. There are a few important aspects about Narcan and its half-life that kind of need to be talked about because it isn't a one-and-done situation, nor is it all fun. One big issue is that since Narcan is such a strong competitive antagonist, it can be very jarring for the person overdosing as the drug kind of kicks in and kicks them out of their high. Now, let's take a mental trip. You're in your bed... Blankets are warm and cozy, you sound asleep, and you feel like nothing can hurt you. Then, some random stranger rips off the cover, shakes you violently, yelling at you to wake up. Now, it doesn't sound like a great time, huh? Well, no, it's not. That's why, when given a full dose or multiple doses of Narcan, some people can wake up extremely aggressive, confused, and e very easily agitated. Is it because they're terrible people? Maybe. But probably not. <laughs> They just need a bit of time to figure out what's going on. The other major problem that I see people having is with the misconception of the half-life of Narcan as opposed to fentanyl. And I know I've said the term half-life about twice now. And for those of you that don't know what that means, uh, in this case, half-life is basically how long the drug is effective for in the body. Now, this is so, so, so important to recognize just because many people will properly deliver the Narcan to someone who is overdosing, see that they're sober, and then leave, or act as if nothing's, you know, happened, or just forget to call 911. This is extremely dangerous because the half-life of Narcan is significantly shorter than that of fentanyl. Narcan is good in the body for anywhere in between 30 to 80 minutes, according to the National Institutes of Health, whereas fentanyl has a half-life of 3 to 7 hours. Let's go back to our gentleman that's been given Narcan for his overdose. Let's say that the Narcan was given to him by a fellow user as they were kind of wise enough to use the buddy system while they were using. After adjusting to being sober again, he thanks his buddy for saving him, continues to chill out, thankful that he just escaped death. Well, since he looks fine on the outside, neither he nor his buddy decide to call 911 because they are a hassle, they treat him like garbage, and they're always rude to them. Plus, he seems fine, so why ruin their evening? Well, about an hour passes without a hitch, but then uh, our gentleman here decides to start to doze off again, slowly, slowly fading in and out of consciousness, and he starts breathing slower and slower. His buddy doesn't really notice uh, since he thinks everything's fine until he looks over, and now all he sees is blue lips and a barely moving body. At this point, he panics, he calls 911, and now every second counts. In this case... He was lucky because his friend was there, but in many cases, they aren't so lucky. Sometimes they run off by themselves with no one to see or help them when that secondary onset happens. Sometimes they're given Narcan by a bystander, which is fantastic, and then they say they're fine, and then, you know, left alone again. The reality of it is that the Narcan that the general public gives can and is life-saving, but it is just a temporary solution while bystanders call for paramedics or take to the person to the hospital for more long-term treatment until the drug is completely worn off in the body. I know I just mentioned in this story, but I do want to mention the two 
most available uh, delivery mechanisms for Narcan available to the public. Now, one is in the form of an IM needle. Those are intramuscular needles that can either be jabbed into the delt or into the thigh. And the other one is a nasal applicator that is just kind of a little thing that you put into the nostril and it sprays a Narcan mist. Both of these are effective and in Ontario and I believe a lot of places in North America now, you're able to get them for free. And so meaning you'll be able to get free tools to help possibly save a life and help someone in crisis as the paramedics get to them. So aside from that, well, what do we as paramedics do differently? And the two things I want to talk about are not the only two options that we as paramedics have as treatment options, but they require equipment that are not normally available to the general public. Now, the first option is supplemental breathing using a BVM and oxygen, a BVM being a little bag that we have that we can squeeze and onto a mask that kind of pushes oxygen into the lungs of our patients. The thought process behind this is that uh, the lethal attribute of the drug is extremely low at rest rate and lack of oxygen delivered to the body. Therefore, depending on the severity of the overdose, instead of drawing the patient awake, risking harm to the paramedics, to themselves, others, and risking the patient then denying further treatment and leaving, only to overdose somewhere else, we might opt to help the patient breathe by squeezing oxygen into their lungs and maintaining that healthy oxygen and CO2 levels. The other option I want to talk about isn't one that is commonly used or one that I've seen uh, during the overdoses that I was a part of, but it certainly is a treatment option that's available. And this is the titration of Narcan through an IV. Now, the reason why some paramedics will offer this option is kind of to circumvent the consequences of suddenly reversing the fentanyl drug and they will start to slowly introduce the Narcan into the system so as to improve respiratory function while reducing the risk of sudden outbursts of violence uh, from the patient. There are mix and matches of treatments and other ways of treating overdoses, but paramedics use their medical knowledge as well as kind of just the situational awareness of what's going on around them to make the right decision. And this is one of the things that I love about being a paramedic is that there isn't always one right answer. And for those of you that aren't paramedics, you might be wondering, well, what can we do? What can I do to help this situation? And to that, I'd just say that even watching this video, being able to willing to learn about fentanyl, about the opiate epidemic and what treatments are available, you're helping to contribute to the general medical knowledge of this crisis. And that in itself helps. But if you kind of want to learn a little bit more, well, First and foremost, I would definitely heavily suggest that you learn about what the telltale signs of opiate overdoses are. Just before I go into this, I just want to say that all of these symptoms are with the assumption that the person you're worried about does have a pulse, all right? And we just want to make sure that you learn basic first aid is everything. That is that is the first thing you want to do is make sure you have basic first aid under your belt, and then you can start to look for these symptoms. Now, one big thing is responsiveness. If you find it difficult or impossible to wake someone up with yelling at them, talking at them, giving them a little squeeze on their shoulder, alarm bells should start ringing in your head thinking maybe this is an overdose and maybe we should start calling 911. The next big thing is definitely the eyes. There's a term that people use called pinpoint pupils, and I'm just gonna show that on the screen now. Uh, basically what it is is the black part of the eye is really, really small, so very constricted, and this is a huge telltale sign of an opiate overdose. And lastly, I know I've mentioned this many, many times before, but respiratory rate is a huge factor. Now, sober, awake, and people at rest will typically take a breath every three to four seconds. Whereas if you suspect someone might be overdosing, you might want to check their breathing. If they're not taking a breath for like eight to 10 seconds, this is very possibly an overdose because they're definitely not breathing as often as they should be. If that's the case and you still haven't contacted your local emergency line, you got to do that right now. And if you have a Narcan kit, now is your time to use it. You very well may have saved that life. Don't leave the patient alone if you can and wait for the paramedics to arrive. With that all being said, though, I just want to make sure that I stress this is that the thing you should be thinking above everything else is your own personal safety. And if you ever feel as though 
that you're in danger or you don't feel safe at all, don't bother putting yourself in danger. Go find someplace safe. Go call 911 or your emergency line and let the emergency services take care of it. Fentanyl is a very dangerous and addictive drug that is taking this continent by storm and ruining thousands of lives on a daily basis. We do have Narcan that does help with fighting the overdoses, but it's not a permanent solution, and people who are experiencing an overdose need to see the hospital. As the public, we need to maintain a minimum level of first aid knowledge, and we need to keep up with that yearly first aid training. If you want to be more prepared, don't hesitate to grab those free naloxone kits available. And, you know, who knows? You might be able to save a life. Has opiates or fentanyl affected you or the ones you love or know? Let me know in the comments below. This will help to kind of spread awareness that this situation and this problem is more common than people think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to support the channel and get more videos like this. And don't forget to stay safe. Until next time, this has been your boy Gamer Medic. See you later.